Hey, Sam. Hello, Kayla. I'm hiking, um, so I'm largely going to be on mute. Okay. And it's only because you'll hear me huffing and puffing, and there might be a point where the internet connection is not stable. So, where just are you? a fair warning. <laughs> I am, let me see if I can turn this on here. Hi. Let me see. Yeah, let me see the scenery there. That looks like a pretty nice place you're in. Yeah. I know, I'm sorry. My dog wants to go. Keep walking, hold on. <laughs> ah, come on. Yes. Here it is. You see it? Awesome. Right? <laughs> Yeah. Nice. How far are you going today? Um, this usually takes me about two hours. Wow. Two hours. That's what? Yeah. Five, six miles? Yes, something. Mm. Not sure. I don't really count the mileage. I used to be able to do that. <laughs> uh, well, you'll get there, I'm sure, if you continue to do your Tai Chi. <clears throat> I'm going to stop the video so that the internet connection stabilizes better. But okay. Well, as you know, Graham's not going to join us today. So yeah. until Alexander gets here, I'll just talk to myself and uh, you'll hear me going crazy. <laughs> You're going crazy? Why? <laughs> I'm just talking to myself. Another <laughs> blather. Well... You can talk to me for a little bit. You're just going to hear me huffing. Yeah, so how was the party yesterday? Um, it was actually just me and my girlfriend visiting um, an area in Lompoc that has some wine tasting, but it's really pretty. It's kind of reminiscent of the Napa Valley. Not as green, but same rolling hills, same vast area of vineyards and we only went to two wineries because she's not you know a big drinker so that was nice <laughs> and she'd never gone wine tasting so she asked some really good questions and it reminded me of the reason why I initially went wine tasting to begin with in my mid-20s but nevertheless we discovered some beautiful hidden gems um, this side of California that I would never have known existed if I didn't just take a gamble to venture there. So are you talking about neither... wine or are you talking about locations? Both. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, so about one and a half, two hours north from here is this little town called Solving. And it's it. a Danish it's town. Very Viking kind of town, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, but if you go on the other side of the freeway, it's called the Santa Rita Hills. And it's, um, it's beautiful. It's, uh, you know, in between the 101 and the 1, near the Vandenberg Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. And there are areas there that um, not too many people go. So it was nice. I've driven through and, there oh, no, no, at least a dozen times, maybe more, maybe two dozen. <laughs> I used to drive from the Bay Area down to uh, L.A. and San Diego and even uh, Mexico a few times. Ooh, nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was probably one of a handful of people that dressed up, so I got a lot of attention. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, did anybody at the party there call you island girl or is that just common knowledge uh no they didn't know what i was ah. except for a couple who nailed it hmm. they looked at me and they're like so are you a tahitian dancer mm -hmm. and i'm all how'd you get it and they said because we've been to tahiti a couple of times 
I said, yep, I sure am. Nice. <laughs> Have you been to Tahiti? Yeah. I lived there for a couple of months. <laughs> Did I tell you my mom went there one time? No. Is there an Air Force base there? Um, not that I know of. Okay, then but it's they... maybe not maybe not Tahiti. It's somewhere in American Samoa. <clears throat> yeah. Because my That's mom American used to Samoa. be a radiologist in the U.S. Air Force. And I know she really? mentioned Tahiti, so she may have gone there from the other base because she went there to go help somebody. And uh, that's actually in her autobiography, by the way. I just read that. Well, they do nuclear testing um, out beyond the Tuamotu Islands, which was a big thing about a decade ago because obviously it kills, you know, the it does something to the ecosystem. What's the name so, of the island? Um, well, I don't, I don't know particularly because the Tuamotus have like thousand, thousands of islands. Um, the island I'm familiar with is Takaroa, and that's a um, pearl farming island. But then again, most of the Tuamotus are pearl farming islands. There's Alexander. Hey, so was one of them Bikini Island, by the way? Because I know we did some testing on Bikini Island. I have no idea. Isn't that a... I'm sorry. Bikini Island, it reminds me of Spongebob. No, it really <laughs> is. It's a place. It's a place called Bikini Atoll. And when the uh, U.S. Uh, DOD mm -hmm. used to do nuclear uh, weapons testing there, I know that because my coworkers, some of them actually went out there um so that's the only way i knew about huh. it that's interesting yeah because in tahiti as you know they go topless so there's not very many bikinis only the bottom portion yeah uh, but that was i i i hi hi uh, alexander alexander hi. you're hiking is what i hear kayla you're you're yes. is that what you're yes. doing yes you can She's hear me five panting. or six mile hike <laughs> and, and like you got like are you 5G or how come you have such good, like, it's like you a cell tower every few, how do you get to tonight's reception when you're hiking? Well, hold on. Maybe I can show you guys again. Yeah. Look at that. Right? Oh my gosh. Oh, so, okay. How nice. Here's the, the city of Camarillo is yeah. those houses beyond there. Mm -hmm. And then this is the hiking trail. Uh -huh. There are people out and about because we've had a time change. Right. So what was your original in question? Day. Bikini. We're talking about Bikini Island. And, and, and I just want to corroborate <laughs> that I, I do. I also know that that was a testing ground for early atomic, um, atomic explosive devices. Mm -hmm. So is that in Tahiti? Because I don't know. Huh. No, I think it was a place called Bikini Atoll. Mm -hmm. I'm going to look up. <clears throat> it was, it was impressive because I know that the guys that went there, they got like 40% hazard pay or something like that. You know, many of them, plus all their per diem and, you know, cost of living. And they stayed out there for months and years at a time. So those guys made out. <laughs> uh, it's terrible. Bikini Atoll, sometimes known as, I can't do this, E-S-C-H-S-C-H. Oh my God. S Schultz Atoll. Uh, between 1800 and 1946 is a coral reef in the Marshall Islands consisting of 23 islands surrounding a 229.4 square mile lagoon. Oh. And it is now a World Heritage Site, apparently. Okay. Yes, that's where the uh, consists of, yeah, with, uh, of 23 nuclear weapons, by wow, detonation of 23 nuclear weapons by the United States. Goodness. Nuclear testing of Bikini Island consists of the detonation of 20 nuclear weapons by the United States between 1946 and 1958 in the Marshall Islands. <clears throat> and a half-life is something really long, right? So we can't even go there anytime soon. 
Yeah, but that's what's interesting about, for example, you, that's what they say about Chernobyl, right? Like, oh my God, it's, it was the, it's the worst catastrophe, at least on land, that, that we've had with regard to uh, a, a, a nuclear atomic cat catastrophe. And the yeah. recent things about uh, what's happening to wildlife there, both flora and fauna, are just booming in Chernobyl. And there's not mutations. And, but not <laughs> recognize these things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey guys, if if I mute myself, it's because I have to go down a rocky hill and I've got my dog with me, so I, I'll need both hands. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Understood. Wait, you, wait, you're not using headphones, Kayla. No, I, I am using headphones, but I'm holding my phone up. Um, oh, right, for signal and stuff. Just because I'm afraid, yeah, I'm afraid that putting it in my little knapsack here will unmute it somehow and you huh. you know you might hear me cursing at my dog hey you know there are some of these little uh, <laughs> straps that you can put to your arms and they come with a little pocket for your phone and uh oh yeah that's right that's like one of those. yeah you can strap it to your forehead you know and all kind of things yeah. there you go <laughs> put a gopro up there as well right. uh, you know maybe uh, a landing pad for a drone too yeah <laughs> <laughs> How did you get to Bikini Island, you guys? Uh, what were we talking? Oh, because uh, Kayla uh, went to a party yesterday, and she went in uh, outfit. She dressed up, bikini. Uh, oh, well, we, no, almost. I didn't see that part. Of it. <laughs> oh wait, wait, no, I forgot. They don't use bikinis; it's monokini. So she went in a monokini. Oh, she definitely didn't show me that part of it. <laughs> oh my god, I might have been kicked out. <laughs> but she did send no, me a, uh, a picture in a uh, costume. Why don't you talk about that, uh, Kayla? Because Alexander <laughs> hasn't had the benefit. Of that. I have not. That's not so, fair. How can um, she send you the picture and not me? <laughs> <laughs> I'll send it to the collaborology study group. Yeah, you How's better. That? <laughs> okay. And well, then William will definitely join us. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, um, you know, in my Tahitian outfits because yeah I spent thousands of dollars on you know authentic Tahitian stuff that I've made and created and everything so I put um you know a little bit of warrior paint and tied my hair up with raffia so it was all full and um I had my neck piece on which I had made myself with um some coconut um shells yeah, and more, that was the name that, so a grass skirt is called more, and more is a part of a bark of a tree that's dried up. So when people say grass skirt, it's incorrect. It's actually bark. So I often wow. tell my students that don't play with the more because you're going to get splinters. You know, obviously mm. nobody, nobody listens, especially if they're five years and up. And so... Right you know, they've learned the hard way. <laughs> but my skirt was an actual skirt that I had um, made, you know, Joanne fabrics, of course, but I used the print of the islands um, to stamp it on. And then there was also the uh, tapa. I don't know if you are familiar with tapa, but it, that that's too a, is from a, a bark of a, a tree. That's like the top part, right? It's the top, that's the tapa. Oh, like no. it's it's tapa, Sorry. kind of like tapas, but without the s, and it's um, utilized to well. What they do is they put, you know, Hawaiians usually put geometric stamps on it, um, and every other islander will either use geometric stamps or whatever symbols their family crest is all over there, and it signifies wealth and it's usually used for ceremonial purposes. So like when my gram died, I mean, the family got rolls and rolls of tapa from, you know, different um, tribes in all of the islands. Uh, Tonga, Samoa, Tahiti. Um, I don't know if they know any Fijians, but yeah, it's a huge ceremony. And in Tahiti in particular, um, there's a dance called uh, the Pa'oa Hibinao, and that's usually a circular dance where everybody sits 
you know, in a circle and they chant and they, um, the people who um, sit, they just kind of slap their thighs or just chant or, or clap. And there's usually one or two dancers to get up to do like a couple solo. You know, it's very joyous. And what that signifies is um, uh, like the making of the tapa. So mm. to break the monotony, um, they would sing and dance. Um, but, but is this something that you're actually, is this part of your clothing? The, I mean, is it, I'm trying to get, ascertain if this is Tupperware. Yes, In yeah, words, it is Tupperware. <laughs> and yeah, it, so. It's not coconut chips, Alexander. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, you can tell me to put a lid on the Tupperware anytime you want. So. Yeah, yesterday I put, um, you know, I sewed a bra and put the tapa you know, on my bra. Um, and then I also made a belt, um, the belt to use on my skirt. That, Kayla. Yeah, I, I do. I just, you know, <laughs> I, don't, yes. I don't know if I took a picture of, of myself in that. Um, but I've made like entire dresses from it. And you can also tie the tapa in a certain um, way for ceremonies. So I have a big piece, and actually, if you want, um, I can experiment with that again. Usually, it takes two people to assist tying um, the actual huge piece of tapa um, hmm. for ceremonial purposes, but I might be able to pull it off. So, so anyway. put it on. Or put it on, as the case may be, Michaela. I would, you know, say. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I might be able to pull it off. I'm not going to quote put you on, it on that. <laughs> yeah, okay. I might be able to pull it off. Now I uh, shouldn't quote you on that out of context, by the way. Yeah. So, yeah. I'll do it. I'm her gay friend. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh <-huh. laughs> okay, all anyway, of a sudden, I'm distracted. Yes, I know. Did. I'm in the rocky part, so I'm going to mute myself now. Okay, good luck there. Don't, yeah, hang tight, hang tight. All right, well, here we are in the, sorry, I was late. I, just, as you know, I don't know if smart people problem or not a dumb person problem. <laughs> Jeez, I managed to be late for anything. I mean, I'm just thinking about it as I was rushing here. Why? I wouldn't have to be late. And, well, and it, like, there was a time change this this uh, this day. Not for me in Argentina. I have no excuse. I have no. No, excuse. but we had a time change. Okay? Yeah, you did. So no. you would have had to at least adjust that. That's true. I mean, it's like it's, it's an hour later. I give you that I mean, excuse. Come on, it's an hour <laughs> later for me rather than an hour earlier. I just, I just, ah, what? I don't know why. But I always managed to be like three to five minutes late or so. Just about. That's about it. It's like, what? Why? Why? It's disrespectful, and I don't like that. And it's just like. But it's like with everything, like, uh, uh, and it's also with things for myself and whatever I'm, I'm do doing, I tend to be like, it's not the last minute rush, but it is, there's a portion of that, I don't know. Right. So anyway. Can I share one of my dumb people problems with you, uh, Alexander, no, on this? No, no, no. Back when I was younger and stupider and foolish and more, you know, self-absorbed. <clears throat> it's possible. I think that there was such a thing as being stylishly late. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think I've... Uh, let's see, in Genesis, your way. good idea, you know. Oh, I good. Okay, good. Uh, on time these days. But yeah, there was a time where I thought that was a thing. It's so, definitely part of the culture here in, in Argentina, <clears throat> although they're, they're working very hard against that idea of being fashionably late. Um, but because classes, everything starts a little late. You always wait for everyone to show up for quorum. And so it becomes like, well, why should I show up at the beginning? It's not going to start anyway. So there's, there's that. It, it kind of builds in on itself. And so yeah uh it's it's uh, it's kind of built in a little bit to the culture here so how have you been this week alexander okay um i'm i'm right now interested if this is sam han or well, how do you pronounce this time of the year i think they call it Samoan, but I'm not exactly sure. That's, some, that's, that's Samoan. That's different. No, Taylor not uh, about that. Samoan. <laughs> not, we got so called. much going on here between Samoan, Samhan, and Samhain. I could never Say figure it out. out. I asked someone one time, and that's what I recall, but that was like 20 years ago. Okay, I just thought it was all about you, Samhain. And most things are about you, aren't they? Well, you? this weekend, it clearly is about me. But yeah, no. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, but it's a three-day period, you know. It goes between now, between the 31st and the 3rd. 
of um, of November. But if when, you're going to observe it, don't you have to be out in the woods, naked, dancing around the fire too? Well, yeah, I don't know about that. They can't do that all day. I mean, dancing around the fire gets tiring. Three days. You know? three days. Three days. Three days of dancing around the fire. Yes. Yeah, but without the, without the really, I mean, that's yeah, that gets that gets. I mean, that's what's in my mind. I haven't done any research on that lately, but it's a wicked yeah. ritual, isn't it? It is. It is. As far as, but no, but apparently, look, I mean, what I got here is in the ancient Celtic calendar, All Hallows' Eve, which begins at sunset on October 31st, marks the end of the old year, and the, and the new year doesn't begin until dawn on November 3rd. Hmm. The intervening days, All Souls and All Saints' Day in days in the Christian calendar, are days outside of time when we can celebrate what happened in the past and discover what is about to happen in the future. In every culture and history, these three absent days are much like the Australian Aboriginal dream time, days out of time, when we can sow the seeds of a new and different world that we envision. So how should, we that? how should we observe that? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I'm observing it with some people who are um, about, the, I mean, the elections are also on the third. So this is really has, a, it's, it's, you know, about the beginning of a new world, etc. Hmm. And sowing the seeds. And I have some friends who, who are also expats living abroad, SMI, and they are saying that they are now sending in their ballot for the third time because they have it verified that it was not received the first times. And now they're sending in a DHL. My, my friend is in, in Austria. And so she's living there. So she's going to send it in by DHL. Um, and she's going to send it in with a, uh, to the postal address, not to the PO box, but although on the inside of the envelope, it has to be to the PO box. And then with the tracking receipt inside, but a copy of it, she keeps just so that they know that she's tracking it like that, because you're sending it in. Apparently it's not, often it's not getting received. So yeah, I, I managed to track mine and saw it. Sorting machines that have been decommissioned and sent it to dumpsters, you know, by the Trumpster himself. Yeah, oh, it's, it's, yeah. So that's a little bit, I mean, I, it's, it's, I don't know, it's tainting the sacredness of the, of this time of these, these, these days in between, but it's well, we also adding Merge those two. Yeah. Right. Tell three me. Three days of celebration, no work leading up to the election so that we can actually, you know, party, celebrate, dance with each other, meet people from across the way, across the hall yeah, nice. and sort of, you know, do some of that. Cause right now, not enough interaction is going on between no. these factions. Absolutely. Even the word party has a whole different meaning in that context. Oh, yeah. Did I tell you about the one attempt I made to actually have a civil conversation with a Trump supporter? Did I tell you that last week? Yeah, I can't imagine. <laughs> based on the brutality kind of uh, frame, the brutalism, the brutalism kind of frame. I don't know. No, how, not based on that one. Kayla, do you remember? Because I actually have had this open invitation for quite a while for a Trump supporter to have a civil calm conversation with me so that I can understand their viewpoint. And I've got very few takers on this, okay? Yes, I had one. you did tell me. Alexander, does this ring a bell? It doesn't. And he even agreed that we could record it. So I have the recording, cool. okay? Uh -huh. So I had this thing with him probably about two, three weeks ago. Wow. And so I got on saying, great, thank you for meeting with me. You know, let's, you know, I wanna understand why you support Trump, you know, just, Let's talk. Why do you support Trump? And he said, well, I support Trump because he's, he's, uh, he's done great things. I have this list of 125 things that he's done. And I said, great, wonderful. Let's talk about the first thing. What do you like about him? And he said, um, can't remember. I'm going to have to get back to you on that. And I said, okay, what? so what about the second? What do you like about him? He can't remember what he likes about him. Right. And he said, no, can't remember any of those either. So I said, well, why don't you get the list? Okay. So basically he's reading off the Breitbart list of 125 accomplishments that Trump has done, okay? So he couldn't actually recall them. He couldn't bring it up on the screen. So then I said, okay, fine. We, we can't talk about his accomplishments. What about his character? You know, what about, you know, how he treats women? Do you have any daughters? You know, blah, blah, blah. He says, yeah, well, character is not as important as what he's done for the country, okay? So <clears throat> this was rather frustrating for me. And it right. went on for probably at least 45 minutes and then I gave up, but I have the recording of it. So basically he's saying that he's done these great things, but he can't actually specify any of the great things that he's done. Not one out of 125, not in the session where I actually let him have all the freedom face. he wanted to bring up all this data, all this right. blind face. Yeah. 
my face. Wow, no. that's really no. interesting. Mm -hmm. Because my friend is the same way. But he'll be more than happy to give you the data that you want. Mm -hmm. So I might, if you're still up for it, I might let you talk to my friend. I'm more but than up for it. I'm more than up for, for it. After the election, I'm up for it, okay? Yeah. Well, I, I do have to warn you, he's been on benzos for seven years. So there's well, that, that aspect of it. I can always hang up on him, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and that'll be fine, because I don't think he'll take it personally. Um, but interesting. I'd like to see that recording. Yeah, so I, I can share it because he agreed to actually have it shared, you know, so <laughs> I don't know what he was thinking. Okay, so <laughs> second opportunity. There's a woman here local on the island who I met at these, um, what do you call these weekend festivals where people sell things, you know, these. Uh, food angles. Yeah. What farmer's are market? Farmer's <laughs> market, yeah, at the oh, farmer's okay. market, okay? So she sells handcrafted soaps and other crafts and that sort of thing. And she really took a liking to my golden retriever. So we got to talking. She seems like a nice person. So, and then I found out she's a very staunch uh, Trump supporter. Huh. So uh, I made the mistake of sending a few articles to her. And she said, stop it. I don't need this negativity. You believe what you believe. I'm going to believe what I believe. You know, she doesn't want to even have that political conversation. And I went so far as to say, but what about this pussy grabbing stuff? You know, what about his character? She says, oh, well, you know, all guys do that. You know, and she's even got a 16 year old daughter. And she said this. Hmm. So that's data point number two. Data point number three, recently, I have a friend of mine whom I uh, went to middle school with, junior high with in Albuquerque. <clears throat> And she's now living in Texas and she is a Trump supporter and I've been posting things. So she sometimes comments on my uh, posts. So I had a uh, uh, anti-Trump post on my wall and she tagged one of her friends. And uh, the very first thing this, this person says on my wall where I posted this thing was something like, well, you can't cure stupidity or something like that. <clears throat> So he went on and made about three or four other posts. So, and I wrote back, actually, my first response was quite a long list of things that Trump has done that I say, you know, do you actually support this kind of behavior? And he didn't directly respond to that, although he did address two or three of those items. So I asked my friend, eventually, who could I have a calm, civil conversation with? And that fellow that made the first, you know, insulting responses was the only person she could actually identify as a calm, you know, civil person I could uh, have a dialogue with. So I may do it, but it's interesting that that's the kind of person that uh, she identifies as a calm, rational person to have a conversation with. Anyway, I've got three data points and uh, I'm still seeking a fourth and I might have a lead on one, but that hasn't actually been confirmed yet. That's my data point for how to reach across the hallway and try and lean into this disagreement and try and understand. Sorry for the long rant. <coughs> no, that's good. What do you think, Ayla? Um, so it's been my experience with Trump supporters that either <laughs> they get very defensive when I've brought up things, um, they, pass it off as being a corroboration by the Democratic Party to slander the president um, or say that it's some type of conspiracy theory. And then the third is the inability to identify, you know, truly why they believe what they do, but, and then the conversation is dropped. Um, so it'd be interesting to hear your fourth data point um, and for that, I might actually see if JJ's wife, so JJ is my friend who is a supporter. Good morning. And um, I've for been talking record, to his wife. A, um, policeman? Okay. No, he is not a policeman. He is a insurance guy. Okay. <laughs> so um, uh, he's, you know, just like I said, Family guy, three kids, um, 
he's been on benzos for the past seven years. Um, huge anxiety problems. But his wife is educated. Um, she works as a recruiter for the medical field. So she's got some interesting insights as well with the COVID-19. And she seems pretty rational. So I might entertain that idea with her, but at the same time, she's pretty much babysitting four kids, <laughs> including her husband. Um, but, you know, <clears throat> I'd like to, I'd like to circle back with you on this. Yeah, I'm very open to having those conversations. I'm trying to lean into this at about one degree angle, you know? Yeah. Not and she really believes, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I just said not 89 degrees, one degree lean. <laughs> she really believes in rational conversations. Good. Like she really embraces that and she wants it. She's kind of tired of the, the limbic hijacking that everyone's experiencing when it comes to these campaigns. This is going to be a weird analogy. I'm just, it, it, it may not hold, it may not hold, but it just, just like Asperger's is a spectrum at the end of which I have autism. It seems like in the, in the, in the Trump domain, you have a spectrum at the end of which is QAnon. But everybody is somewhere on the spectrum. I mean, in, 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 the, in, the, in the Trump world, there's somewhere in some form of QAnon. There. And then you take it to the extreme, it's QAnon. That's, that's the extreme, uh, you know, fanatic, fanatic dogmatic, uh, and, and brutalistic uh, holding. But it, it, it's, it's somewhere on there that has those components, and again, of ignorance of, of uh, supremacy, white supremacy, of ignorance and, and, and brutalism. Seems like they're in there somehow. So uh, I'd be interested, Sam, when you listen to, when you get the, uh, you know, all of you, any of your data posts, you want to reflect on that as well now, you know, how they have those components. Did they kind of corroborate the article? Did they have those three things? It seemed like ignorance was in there a bit. Uh, it seems like, uh, I don't know about the supremacy, but there certainly was at least the, the, um, That's the word for it, where you're, you're sanctifying or you're saying it's okay for minorities or for people in power to abuse their power in certain ways over those who don't have the power. And in this case, we were talking about the women and, and, and uh, that she was okay with the, you know, his treatment of women and his idea of, of pussy grabbing, et cetera. So you have that kind of thing there. And then the brutalism, I don't know if that's in there, but that would be more the bit more Kayla, what you're talking about, where sometimes they just they just shut you down and they'll say, no, I'm not. That's it's not the open conversation that you're looking for, Sam. That's why I think it's also hard to find because it's a it's a smaller. I've been subset. looking for months. It is Years. open to that. Yeah, I think that the, what is unstated is this disregard for other people. There doesn't seem to be uh, a valuing of other human beings as entitled to a reasonable life. That doesn't seem to play. And I think what is underneath it is some form of Darwinism that, hey, you know, you can't get by. It's because you're weak or you're stupid. You know, I'm successful because I'm smart and I'm successful and I have, you know, strength and, you know, whatever. So I deserve what I get. That's the brutalism. Oh, that's, that's the brutalism. Yeah, that's the brutalism. But that's the, the, that's the old, that's old, very, very old Darwinism, right? I yes. mean, not that even new Darwinism particularly I'm a fan of, but, but uh, Jonas, Salk has, Jonas Salk has this nice book out called Survival of the Wisest, right? Different than Survival of the Fittest. Mm -hmm. And so you have a different orientation in that, in that frame, which is evolutionary as well. And it uses some, kind of some of those inclusive fitness concepts right. from that, uh, that, kind of, that kind of Darwinism. But here is brute of course. I mean, it's like if I if I can take and you can't keep it, keep me from doing that, then you don't deserve to have it because I'm better, stronger, more evolved. That's right. And if but I can the use the system to back me up, I'm even smarter than that. That's right. 
That's right. And if I've crafted the system to preserve that, well, good for me. Uh, my daddy can beat up your daddy. No, that can I got a whole, and I, my family can take on your family. My, my mafia can take, and it's like, it's like and okay, fine, my party. I mean, what's the difference? My party can take over your party. My people, because they look like me, can take over your people, whatever, you know. It's, and I think it's, 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 not, it's not just the anti, you know, anti, or I don't know what you call it, uh, anti-humanism in a certain way, but it's, it's, it's what is considered human. You know, the Napoleon Chagnon in his beautiful books on, uh, on anthropology and cultural anthropology looked at um, these, these people in the, in the Amazon, the Yanomama, and uh, he, he, he found that the word Yanomamo means human. So they were the Yanomamo and everyone else was not. But that happens so often that we, we are actually people and we can either enslave you or do all kind of brutal things to you because you're not really human. Right. Even women that are othering. only 60% human, right? Huh? The Even what? women are only 60% human. That's right. Right. That's right. We're witches. Brought my broom yesterday. You did? Making a clean sweep of things. <laughs> what spells did you cast? Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, but you see, this is the thing. I just got this today. Uh, this uh, interesting, uh, I'm going to put it into our common chat area chick, chick, here. Um, this interesting article on ads from Are you frozen or am I offline now? Did you I... might be frozen because I heard, I can hear you. I can hear like something. I heard um, you. And so is Alexander frozen for you also? I think so. Ah, he's gone. <gasps> no. You cast a spell on him. <gasps> That's right. Oh you my gosh. Spell him. <laughs> <laughs> What I was going to say to you, Sam, is the word justification brought was in my mind when you were talking about your friend and um, or the the people you'd met. Um, like I feel like uh, everybody needs some type of justification for their behavior, especially when they're wrong. You know, um, excuses, uh, but more justification, especially if you're going to continue to do something. You know, so what's interesting behind that is this recognition that what you may be doing or perceiving could be wrong. You know, and rather than question, questioning it, most people justify it, you know, just because they can't really see or learn beyond that. You know, I think there's a lot there because that brutalism article even alluded to the fact that most of these white people, most of these white families know that their wealth was on the backs of blacks who were enslaved for hundreds of years. And mm -hmm. even though the current generation may not have been the slave owner, maybe not even two or three generations back, but they're definitely inheriting some of the land, some of the wealth, some of the inheritances that came out of the unjust uh, exploitation. And it's under the surface. So they don't want to explicitly acknowledge it, but they know it's there. Alexander, sorry you dropped out, but I was just saying, uh, Kayla was actually saying, by the way, that there was this justification, this needing to justify one's behavior. And I was alluding again to the uh, brutalism article, which essentially made the point that even though current generations of white families may not actually be slave owners, some of them know that they're descendants of slave owners. And some of them know that their land has been worked by people who didn't have a choice. And there's some of that decades or centuries old, I don't know, guilt may be too strong a word, 
but something leaning towards, you know, feeling a little bit responsible for this oppression, but yet not doing it themselves. Say, hey, it wasn't me. Don't look at me. Right? That kind of attitude. I, I see some of that. And there's a collectiveness to it, too, especially when it's in regards to the president. You know, oh, yeah. You know, every man says, says some bullshit. You know, I catch myself saying dumb shit. Doesn't make it right. You know, JJ has two daughters, two beautiful daughters. And he straight up told me that that was a pretty weak argument to use President Trump's character um, as a means not to vote for him. And I said, that's not what I'm trying to say. <laughs> you know, everybody has some type of character flaws, but you cannot justify it. You know, um, and I would like to think in this society, we have elevated beyond that, you know, utilizing the Me Too movement and just, you know, there's been time now where it is truly unacceptable to treat women in the manner that, you know, we've been being treated. And from our president, from our chief commander, from the person who is running this nation, you'll want to uphold him to the highest standards. To other nations. Exactly. Yes. So, you know, I'm not here to argue, you know, entirely based on one aspect, one facet, you know, but it's just to point out, this is, is this something that we should consider? Is this something that represents us? Anyway, nobody wants to be wrong. Nobody wants to feel wrong. And that whole just portion of it makes you feel less wrong. I think so that's anyways. A part of it, Kayla. I mean, for me, the, the idea that, that, look, I have privilege. I have, the, I have uh, was able to get things. And I have wealth and I have land. And a lot of this is because of the things that Sam, you were saying, had to do with the, the things that I've inherited. I've inherited this privilege, this land, this wealth. So maybe I don't have all that wealth, but the, 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 or maybe I don't even have a lot of land, but I'm part of a group that does. And you want to take that away from me? I, why? Look, if you take that away from me, right now I'm the one that's in power. And if I'm not in power anymore, then I might be the minority. And I know how minorities are treated because I treat them that way. And I'll be damned if I'm going to be a minority. It's scary. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to put myself in that position. I'm going to stay in this position where I have the privilege and the power over. Because if, if I'm not over having the power over the others, it's going to be an inversion. And then I'm going to be somehow in that, and well, I'm going to give up this privilege. Forget that. So it's a, I think it's scary. And there's also a sense of entitlement saying, my ancestors worked for this. We built a great nation. This is what we did. And we have this, it was built on, on, on the, this, this stratification. And what that's, anyway, the bottom line is, that's the way things are. That's the way it works. And we want to keep it working like that because it's working for us. And, and, and anything else might be seriously not working for us. I mean, that's scary. So that's one thing. Another thing was what I was <laughs> trying to go on before my wonderful connection here in Argentina dropped. Um, apologize for that. Uh, is this thing that I shared on our, on our um, uh, what's it called? Our Facebook Messenger group is uh, the ads from the vintage ads that probably wouldn't be in today's day, but these are really ads that went on. And yes. th the thing is that a lot of these things are actually still in the mindset of, of people today. Um, so, I mean, I just, I look at the, if you look at the very last one, for example, um, of these ads. The last one here is, is it always illegal to kill a woman? 
and there's an ad in there, and they, 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 when they talk about it, saying, I'm not really quite sure what they were. I mean, they're selling a, a stamp machine, a postage meter, right? That's what it was about here. But the title in that thing, I mean, it's like disturbing. And there's several of these other ones that are disturbing. There's, you know, there's there are things that are rude advice, things that are just, uh, especially with regard to attitudes towards women. Um, and this was part of mainstream U.S. culture for you know, many, many years. And there's what's called the long tail of things. There's stuff which it might not be actual right now, but it's still in the psyche in many ways for many people. They're saying, especially for men, because you look at most of these ads and it's really, really comfortable for men because they're getting served. And uh, I think that's part of the, you wanna take away that comfort? You, wanna, you, wanna, you want me to give that up? Why should I? We, we have it good and I'm not gonna give it up. For what? For whom? Anyway. Flip side. Yep. If we do have to give it up, and we are becoming the minority, your, your first point, if they do become the minority, they're afraid of the retaliation, right? Just knowing what the, the minority treatment is like because they've done it to other minorities. So they expect that to be exactly. perpetrated exactly. on That's them. That's the point. They won't, they're Probably not going to be treated worse like that. Because right. there's this getting back, you know, that they're afraid. They're lynched? Do you think they might be lynched? It could be. Because there was lynching, obviously. Exactly. You know? And Hollywood feeds this kind of stuff. The whole revenge. I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you, Sam. But anyway, yeah. There's, no, it's yeah. true. It's the, it's the pendulum always swings further than the center in order to stabilize. This is why they're worried. There's this great, there was this great study put out on it in the 1990s, I guess, by the Harvard negotiation team. Um, they had a whole Harvard negotiation project and they had a team and William Fisher and Roger Urey wrote this great book called Getting to Yes, Negotiating Agreement Without Giving In. And it was kind of pretty much a landmark. And um, one of the things they said there is to separate the people problem from the problem problem. <laughs> and they said, it's so easy to say, okay, you're the problem, or it's because of the way you're thinking, or it's because of you know, who you are. And it says, if you can look at what are our common interests, not what are our positions, separating positions from interests. Because interest is something you can explore. What are we, what are we, are we interested in? If you say, what's your position? You set up camps. Literally, you set up a camp like, like in the military. Here's my position and here's your position. I was strategically going to face off. So we got these camps and parties are pretty much camps. And then, but if we look at what is our common, what is our interest? What is your, what are you interested in? And what am I interested in? So let's do a Venn diagram and look at the things that we're both interested in. That allows you to explore common ground without looking at your positions on them. It just is like, what is, what are you interested in? So that's a whole different level of conversation that takes it a bit beyond the, the people problem, uh, which a lot of this, a lot of this goes down into saying, Hey, this is just about, is he a good person or a bad person? You know, or do I like him or not like him? That's not actually as helpful as possible for creating a, a path forward in terms of governance. Um, it's a good book, Harvard Negotiation, uh, the, um, Getting to Yes. I would also add the book, uh, Crucial Conversations by a guy named Patterson, I forget his first name, Ken or Kyle or something like that. <clears throat> but I just posted a link to another uh, graphic. Unhealthy conflict and healthy conflict, yeah. Yeah. I think it's this, you know, can we stand side by side and look at the conflict together as opposed to uh, you know, being adversaries, right? Thinking that the other is the problem, right? Same thing. Yeah. I think it's a nice graphic, uh, you know, depiction of that, that I like. So. Nice. How do we Thanks, you guys. That was a very sexy conversation. I love it. Says the woman with a tupa. Tapa. Tapa. Sorry. Tapa. Ah, sorry. Gosh. Gotta get it right. <laughs>
<laughs> right. You should have seen her face paint. She looked quite fierce yesterday. Cool. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing that. <laughs> Waiting. I'm going to wait until you, you got, probably have to get someplace. Uh, Kayla, can, we can share that. But yeah. Um, Kayla, uh, do I have permission to share that? You know what? I have a better, I have a better picture, but yeah, share whatever you need to. Not, yeah. I mean, need, but yeah, share whatever you want. <laughs> All right. I will share this too. <laughs> Here you go, Alexander. There's the picture that uh, Kayla shared with me yesterday. Cool. Nice. <laughs> nice. And did you see you did all of that yourself, Kayla? Yeah. That is yes. Amazing. Yeah. It's part of the package. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that's what one thing I love about that culture. They just teach you everything from the ground up. You know, from from the time you were children, your kids. You know, as a matter of fact, my son was getting very frustrated. I forgot what we were doing. I think we were cooking. And I said, yeah, what I say to everybody that I try to teach, you got how first of all, you have to start from somewhere. Second, you just have to keep practicing. You know, and third, even as an adult, I still get it wrong. Just keep trying. And that's all you can do. Well, it's very nice. I mean, there's somehow it's this combination of, of uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's earthy and hearty, it's fierce and it's beautiful. Uh, so it's a very nice, it's very nice, very nice the, what comes across there in the photo. Mm -hmm. I love those earth tones. You know, yeah. Kayla, you just... and I are probably cousins a few generations back. Aren't we all? From the Pacific yeah. Islands. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah. As you know, the, uh, the Taiwanese Aborigines, not that I'm an Aborigine from Taiwan, but they were part of the Polynesian uh, South Pacific uh, culture, even though I'm part of the group that came over from the mainland around 1720s. Got it. Good morning. Good morning. So where can we go from there? I mean, we've... So much of it is just, I hate to just be mired in and wallow in regret about the current status of things. Seems like there's a more... Actually, can I... Yes? You dropped out there for a moment, Kayla. You're on, actually, yeah, dropped. Wait, 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 wait. We don't have your mic on. Yeah, Kayla, you're on mute. If oh. you're... Okay. <laughs> um, I'd like to branch off on the idea of privilege, if I may. Uh -huh. Because I had an interesting conversation with my cousin, whom I hadn't spoken to for about six years. You're welcome. And we had a falling out. Um, and it was very... Thank you. You're welcome. Curious to think that she thought I was a privileged person. Now, coming from the islands, um, she was telling me, so I came here with my father and mother because my father was in the military. He served with the US military, US Navy to be specific. And, um, you know, um, we had our fair share of whatever <laughs> in the United States, but we were still, we still grew up here in the United States. Um, by the time my cousin came, she was, uh, she was a teenager. Um, we had sponsored her to come and to be forthright, um, their family was illegal for some time. Mm -hmm. So um, in order to survive, everyone had to work. Um, my cousin had to work, her sister um, and their little brother had to work. All of the money was given to her mother and it was, you know, her parents, of course. And it was a sore spot for them. Um, so part of the reason, and I won't go too, too much into it, but part of the reasons why we argued was I told her, I asked her, why are you injecting Botox in your face? You don't need it. You know, why are you having breast implants? You don't need it. Um, and it was as simple as that. You're beautiful. You shouldn't have to worry about stuff like that. 
Well, she took great offense to it, acted like a child, said all these obscenities to me, and didn't talk to me for six years. So when we finally talked last night, it was such a good conversation. But she said that the reason she was upset is because she worked so hard to blend into society. Um, and that she thought me and my family were privileged. Um, and so of course I could afford to, you know, philosophize in beauty. <laughs> you know, I'm, and for whatever it is she, for her insecurities, she, she was working on it in her way. And it was really interesting to me that she told me I was privileged. I don't consider myself privileged. But in some way, shape, or form, um, she depicted me as such. And it just got me to thinking of privilege in general. So privilege as I know it is as you described it, um, Alexander. You know, great wealth, power, um, more opportunities. But there's also privilege among the middle class. But maybe she was, do you think she couldn't be talking about, because there's privilege also in the sense, uh, all of these things can, can put oneself in, 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 in labeled categories that, that does, doesn't allow one access to things that others, for others come easy because that's the nature of privilege things you you're, you're you got the silver spoon you're born with the silver spoon whatever that you know the expression you're born with silver spoon all that so things that come easy to some are not so easy to others and privilege can also be in terms of beauty or looks um so if she was trying to fit in and she was doing things for her looks in terms of you know and Botox and implants and so on. Maybe she was talking to you, Kayla, with regard to the fact that, or her view that, you know, you are beautiful and that you you have that privilege and that you don't need to do these things that she needs to, and that for you it's transparent and it's you don't even you don't even have to think about it. But for her, it's not. Could it be that? Yeah, it could be that. Um, but I also grew up with a mindset. Um, I think I told you this story, Sam. Um, but my father was pretty straightforward and blunt with me. There was a time when I was 17 that I was given money to model for the Chinese community, which is awesome. Um, and I got good money for it. So of course, of course, I wanted to be a model. You know, I'm going to be a model. I'm going to make all kinds of money, and I and then I'm going to go into acting. My father straight up said, first of all, you're going to be old and fat and no one's going to like you. Then what are you going to do? You know? <laughs> and then he's like, and then what, consider what kind of men are going to be attracted to you. They're only going to be attracted to you because you're pretty, and blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> it was harsh and mean and she, he shit on my dreams. But I'm glad he said that to me because it caused me to think a certain way. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, yes, but there are opportunities Absolutely. to consider certain, certain things in certain ways. And I did tell my cousin, I've always been very jealous of her complexion and her hair and her height. This yes. woman has been a meth addict before. And when you think of meth addicts, you think, you know, really gaunt, picking their face. Even when she was on drugs, she still looked good. <laughs> so, you know, the, the idea of beauty, you know, really is kind of on the eye of, eye of the beholder. Um, but it's interesting that she used the word privilege because it's not what I thought, hmm. what I know privilege to be. Can we separate <clears throat> a, a capital P it's privilege from lowercase p privilege? I think that, you know, if we allude to what we just talked about as capital P privilege, 
there's this more subtle kind, which is this notion that if that problem is not happening to me, that's kind of a little bit of privilege right there, right? And that can be everywhere. True. I mean, the fact that we're having this conversation is very privileged. Yeah, not everybody can do this two hours, you know, on a weekend morning. Absolutely. This is extreme privilege. No, I'm, 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 Which is I'm why either. I'm so sensitive about wanting to not squander this time because it's so precious. Our conversations I don't view as squandering, but when people call, come to GCC and say, you know, how come you guys are wasting all this time? To me, there's a real investigation. There's a real experimentation going on there that may not be evident. Well, here's a roundabout um, story uh, that, that relates to the broader subject matter of, of, of our conversations and to this question of, of privilege. And I think really to the an undercurrent, I, I think, of what I'm, what I'm hearing in our conversations has to do with empathy or being able to really, truly appreciate the other person's point of view without othering, without othering. I mean, you, you can other person's point of view, but not othering. It's, it's a little trick in that. How do you do that? But um, there was a, a colleague of mine who was teaching at Antioch, actually, not far from you, Sam, uh, in the whole systems program there. Um, and uh, he was from uh, Madagascar, if I remember correctly. Um, and he said his, his childhood was very difficult because uh, he actually, I, I don't think he knew his parents. He was in a large house. They were, had to work. Everyone had to work, but they all, a lot of people lived in this house. He had 12 people living in his room at the same time. And most of them were children. And then they all went out to work. And it was basically a hand, hand to mouth uh, subsistence. So they were living and, 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 and if they weren't working a day, then they would have a hard time eating and which made things worse. Um, people didn't seem to care too much because there were so many of them. So it didn't matter if they didn't, didn't make it. So it really was, the, the stakes were high. You, you, had to, you had to really push through. And this is what he remembers from an early age on. And he told a story about one of his students when he was asking everyone to share what were some traumatic experiences in their life that they learned to overcome and that, that, that or that may still be with them that they can share you know things that they would like to share that has to do with their own personal growth and putting them into their beyond their comfort zone but also areas that truly maybe not necessarily traumatic but really things that 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 were trans that marked them marked them right in certain ways okay so that, I, I can't remember i if this was a tea group or what it was, but it was it would have to do with some thing where that was an appropriate exploration. He told the story of how one of his students shared that when she was young, uh, I don't know, less than ten, um, at dinner time, her mother required her to eat her broccoli, and she just really, really hated the, the and she, she could, it was like almost very difficult for her to even put in her mouth, let alone chew. And then swallowing was, was, it just almost couldn't do it. And, and it was, it was just so horrible for her. And, but her mother forced her to do that, told her that she couldn't get up from the table until she had eaten her broccoli. And she said that she felt this was just the height of cruelty. My, my colleague said, based on what he had to go through as a child, he felt this was insane that she thought that was traumatic. She was complaining about having to eat broccoli when they were eating, I mean, he told us some of the things they, eat, they ate just to survive. Um, and broccoli would have been heaven. And 
and he he really had a hard time with that and i was fascinated by the hard time he had <laughs> with that by by him and it made me just think about how relative all of this thing is because okay in, in the bigger scale of what it is to be human i mean that was not that was not a huge challenge but for her it was at that age given all the things that life had prepared her for that was that was a huge challenge for her to eat the broccoli and that was okay so but if given her context and her framing that was it was traumatic and how can we say your trauma is not as bad as my trauma i i got i got to see you consider that a trauma listen to mine or you can consider that an issue listen to my issue that for me is the way that leads to this kind of intolerance and this kind of othering and this kind of it's you know you're not you don't really have the issues so even listening to and i love what you're doing sam by listening to the people who are in the other camp you know what, what is it that really is why are they so afraid how can we help them and reassure them that we are all human and that there is space enough and means enough for all of us to thrive and that we don't have to divide the pie in this way where i get what is the, what the, what's there to get because i already have access to that and i'm not going to give that up because if i give it up then i won't have it but how can we say there is a way through really renewable circular economy all the stuff that we know that can allow us to thrive together and that it's going to be by educating them because they don't want that but how can we kind of be that change in ways that that embrace that hug embrace is too cold a word that hug that say hey we can be we can be in this together and i'm not trying to steal your privilege i'm i'm just trying to make it not exclusive so that we can all be privileged on this planet just for being alive and not more privileged than any other animals or plants either just it's a privilege i like that idea of empathy a lot practicing empathy um something that i strive to do on a daily basis even with people who caused dissonance in my life for such a long time see the last few minutes for me have been a little bit triggering i'll just say that up front because around this notion of parenting i tried to give my kids a good life and now my kids are in a position to tell me what a mistake that was my son was telling me he didn't go through enough hardship when he was young so he wasn't fully equipped to handle all the adult responsibilities and adult challenges that he's meeting now on the other hand my daughter my older daughter feels like i was way too hard on her that i made demands on her that I didn't make of my son. So she thinks it was very unfair. And a little bit of context there. When she was 12, she became one, she was within one pound of being diagnosed as anorexic. Because the previous year, my ex wife, her mother, had lost 60 pounds in one year gone from like, I mean, literally, it must have been like 205 down to like 145. And that made a huge, evidently made a huge impression on my uh, daughter, that my ex wife was getting all these accolades for losing all this weight. So my older daughter thought, oh, she should hold her weight down. So I mean, I'm just mansplaining at this point. Okay. But I'm just guessing. But on the other hand, you know, my requests for her to eat well and get the right nutrients were met with all kinds of objections, not just by her, but my ex-wife, and then her nutritionist, and then her counselor, and then her therapist, and then her other advisors, and they all said, but up. 
And I thought that was very, very unprofessional. They clearly thought that I was part of the problem, but they didn't address any of that directly with me. So I feel like, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't. You know, I got both extremes there. The So far, the good thing is with my third child, Veronica, who has a few friends over from last night, she and I, as far as I know, have an excellent relationship. And uh, I can, I'm there for her for any question. And I did ask her, you know, is there anything that you feel you cannot ask me? And she asked me about these guys who want her to be her boyfriend. So she comes and asks me for advice. And then the very next month, she asks me about what to do because another guy asked her to be her boyfriend. So at least she's confiding, you know, those kind of things with me. And I believe we're actually on very, very good terms. And she, every time I ask her, you know, she would prefer to live here than down in California with her mother. So I just don't get this parenting thing. You know, I don't know how to do it right. You know, this extreme, this problem, that extreme, that problem. It's really hard to sort of communicate what you're doing. And even if you are, it's hard to communicate it so that the, the child understands. Maybe that's just the privilege of being a, a parent. Who knows? You know, we all have that. It took me quite a while, by the way, for me to... Um, forgive my parents because I used to treat them very badly and they yeah I really treat them like shit when I was uh when I was young not my dad so much more like more my mom uh so here's a little bit of confession you know I was a shit as a teenager not knowing how to do the parenting thing and having gone from one side to the other side and getting both kinds of criticism about either making things too easy or making things too hard and not knowing exactly how to draw that line. I don't know where that's leading. I just thought that that was something that got triggered in me. Oh, it was leading to privilege. Sorry, <laughs> this whole notion of privilege is that I was wondering if we could actually look at privilege a different way. And it is connected. And I was thinking rather than saying it's how other people think I've got it good, can it be a way for us to just say, I am thankful for this XYZ, whatever XYZ is. And I am privileged to be able to appreciate that. Morning. Morning. Is it okay to just leave it there? Privilege is not necessarily always a bad thing. I am privileged to be on this call with you two. I'm privileged to live here in the Pacific Northwest. So I don't think it's necessary to always attach this negative connotation or implication always to this word privilege. I do know that they can be that way if one abuses one, one's privilege. So I think there's the notion of abuse separate from the notion of privilege. And I think it's the abuse that ought to be called in question over. Kayla? Well, I am very privileged to be your friends and to be on this call in this beautiful setting. Um, but it also goes to show that the fact that we're actually looking at this largely from a negative con connotation is because we want to, to somehow make it better, you know, for those who feel abused by that. So there's something to be said about this conversation around privilege. That's all I have to say. 
you know that that um i yes aho <laughs> ashe <laughs> yes and all that um the um I think it comes back to empathy again. Um, okay, so there, so three things: empathy, non non competitive privilege or non destructive privilege, and ahimsa. I want to touch on these three things. But let's do the second one. What I mean by non competitive privilege is, is the word competition has gotten you know a bad rap. People are like, oh, competition is like, if, why should you compete with others? You should, you know, you just altruism is better. We should work together, et cetera, et cetera. That has to do a little bit with the parenting issues as well, Sam. Um, but um, the terms that have evolved and are no longer even that new. There's the word trans competition, and there's a, even a more popular term, coopetition, and that's you know competition and cooperation together is coopetition. And the idea in that is that it's non-negative competition. Non-negative because it could be neutral, right? So it's, it's not just positive, it's non-negative, which means we can compete to raise each other up. We can compete that we both can do better. Or we both can achieve, we can both can. That's, that's co-opetition, right? It's not win-lose competition, it's win-win competition. Okay, in the same way, can't we have privilege in the same way saying, how privileged we are to be on this call, kind of things that we're all saying here, how privileged we are to be alive. I'm actually working, my main source of income these days is working for a foundation called a Network for Grateful Living, A-N-G-L, spells angel, A-N-G-L, Network for Grateful Living. And in, the, um, in, in Argentina, that is expressed as vivir agradecidos. So it's, is living in gratitude or living with gratitude it's not just grateful living. It's a way of life that is, every step is of gratitude. And it's based on the teachings of a, of a Benedictine um, monk, our brother David Stendhal Rast. Okay, so he's kind of the, literally the father figure in this movement. Um, okay, cutting out soon, okay. All right, um, I just wanted to uh, say though that this idea of, uh, privilege that could be inclusive privilege, not exclusive privilege, privilege where we are privileged, where we're, we're grateful for the privilege that we have together, for being together. Why, why not? That can be inclusive, just the same way as competition doesn't have to be me against you competing. And privilege doesn't have to be me over you in privilege. So that human dignity entitlement, we're all privileged to have that entitlement. We're all privileged to have human dignity and we should, shouldn't be taken from anyone. It's a birthright. And this comes to the last point, which is ahimsa. Ahimsa is, is this, um, I don't know, I don't want to go into this if you're already familiar with ahimsa. There she left. Okay, bye. We're recording this anyway. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, uh, you know of ahimsa? No, I've heard the word, but I don't know what it means. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, it came interestingly enough at a conference I was at, I heard this uh, uh, Indian man speaking from, from, from India, uh, or a, a Hindu, um, speaking about, he said, Ahimsa Paramo Dharma. And what that, what, and then he gave his whole presentation and I came and I talked to him afterwards. He was so intense, uh, a beautiful man. And he said, uh, it means ahimsa is a way of life. It's a credo. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's dharma. It's a way of engaging in life. And ahimsa is poorly translated to English as nonviolence or do no harm. But it's much more than that because it's a proactive stance. So he explained that, for example, if the lioness kills a gazelle, to feed her cubs, the lioness is practicing ahimsa because it is part of the natural flow. If a hunter kills a deer for sport, they're not practicing ahimsa. If you tease somebody uh, cruelly, that's not ahimsa. If you share a joke with somebody, that is not against ahimsa. It's not that it's positive. It's not, it's just, that's, not, that's not either 
yes or no, but it's not against that use. <laughs> Sherry Joe, it's not, it's not, but it's not, it's not life affirming, but taking of life can be life affirming as well when it is part of the natural cycle of things. The difficulty is the moral sense, like, okay, to what extent is that taking, you know, to what extent is that cruel? We, there, there, there are studies about uh, chimpanzees who will, for example, a chimpanzee who has uh, found a, uh, an extent of wire, like an, uh, an old hanger, and it's straightened out, and uh, it can, can call the chicken toward them, and then when chicken gets close, hit the chicken with a wire, and then the chicken goes away, and then he calls the chicken to war again. It's, again it's, it's clearly just fucking with a chicken, you know? That's not ahimsa. So it's not that the whole natural world is, uh, is, is always in, in, in ahimsa, right. um, but it is, it can be, it's, it's a way of syntony, right? You know my whole area of syntony. Yes. This is actually an other expression of the Tao, exactly. of syntony. Yeah, it is really is all that whole, but it has to do in this case with, I think it's more relevant because it has to, uh, with, with privilege, because it has so much to do with empathy. Uh, in this aspect, ahimsa has to do with, is this life affirming for the other? Is this something that is, uh, it, and whether it's, it takes the life of the gazelle, is it affirming for gazelle? You know, yes, it is. I mean, the gazelle actually need to be not overpopulating and so on. It's, it's a whole arguments there, but. Makes sense. So I, I think Ahimsa is great for, for furthering empathy and for promoting non-competitive or you know, co like this co-opetition. Maybe there should be a word for, um, I don't know what the word for privilege that would be, would be that would be combining it with privil privil privilege and, um, you know, shared privilege, I don't know, yeah, it's human dignity, entitlement, I'm trying to think, it's, it's cooperation and competition become co-opetition. So privilege and inclusion, maybe it's uh, impriv or privilusion, I don't know. <laughs> How about if it's like this notion of reaching a hand down to pull someone up because you actually have the opportunity to do so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? That's the only time, quote unquote, you should be looking down on someone. So I like can I ask that. one thing. Can I ask one thing about that, Sam? Because yeah. it happened just yesterday when we were shopping. Mm -hmm. Just yesterday when we were shopping. I'm not going to go into this. Uh... Anyway, we were shopping, <laughs> getting food, and we go shopping every two weeks because a we don't like to go out in the store. I mean, it's still everyone's with masks. It's like it's still an issue here. So go every two weeks, and we buy, uh, we buy the store. <laughs> I mean, we go for two weeks, and we get everything. We don't need them to go shopping. We eat that. We spend the rest of the time. You know, for two weeks we have enough food yep. but so we ha we have a little we we bring our little carts with us each of us and we carry bags on our shoulders on the way back i mean it's a shitload of food um and so there was somebody at the door who's waiting there as a beggar at the door sitting outside okay so when we're paying and checking out and it takes a long we always let people go ahead of us because we take forever because we have two carts worth of stuff Mm -hmm. And we let people with just like a handful always go. We, we, ask, we often are let, let 10 people go in front of us who come behind us and no, you go first. I'm like, nah, mm -hmm. that's all right. And then, then we, we go and the line starts to form and it takes a long time and we pack up everything. And I'm always racing with a cashier who's, who's checking things through and I'm trying to put them in the bags, see who gets done first. She's mm -hmm. faster than me always. But uh val said hey, i'm gonna take a milk and give it to the person so that's one of the milks that we bought mm -hmm. i said did we have did we get enough milk because no that's okay we'll, we'll just we'll go and I'll get another milk if we were not that's okay we'll just we'll do that <clears throat> and on the way out she said you know it just it pains me that we are there in buying such abundance of food and this person doesn't have anything or doesn't is be they're begging so I, I really must give them something That didn't, it, it, I appreciated the sentiment, but it, that guilt, the guilt purpose of, I mean, the sense of I have to do this because it's, it was embarrassing how much we're getting and that they don't have anything. I don't know, There's, it didn't sit well with me because we're not affluent. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're making it, but, and if, if we had, 
to donate. I mean, if we, if I could set up a fund, I'd be, I'd, be, I'd love to do that, but I'm, we're not in that position. And because we do this every two weeks, rather than buying a lot every day or whatever, or a little bit every day, rather, it, it, it seems like how could we be, it looks like maybe we just have so much cash we're throwing around and buying so much food. But I don't know, if you don't know what we're doing and what our eating rhythm is and, and how much we're earning and then, then, then how can we feel guilty about this and, and then need to, it's not, it shouldn't be out of guilt is what I'm saying. Yeah. So it, that's, yeah, I'm still struggling with that. Anyway, I don't have an answer. It's, it's a difficult issue because the right way to answer this is to answer in a systemic way, but we can't, we're in no position to do that yet. So we could only answer in the local way. And I don't know your situation. You don't know my situation. I do the best I can. You do the best you can. And we both know we're both trying to do the best we can. It has to do with reaching down to pull somebody up. I mean, that's, that's, that's what it was. So if, the sense of that I feel guilty, I'm doing it because I'm, I'm not, I ought to do this because I have and they don't, that, that, that doesn't do it for me. I, I, I don't think it should be I'm out of guilt. It should be out of, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a privilege that I have that I can do this and I celebrate. I, ahimsa shouldn't be a privilege. It should, I mean, it shouldn't be a, a, a guilt. It should be because- Or it shouldn't be the elimination of a guilt. Yeah. Right, okay, there we go. Right. Yeah. No, I agree. Because if it's in the elimination of guilt, it's all still about me. Right? Mm-hmm. I'm making myself feel better by doing this. That's regardless right. of whether it's actually making That's a difference right. for the person. That's right. Does this person actually want milk? Maybe the person actually wants alcohol. In which case, you know, how would Val have felt? Right. You know? And I go through this actually quite often. What, wanting alcohol? <laughs> Knowing that someone else wants alcohol. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Knowing that someone else drinks alcohol and trying not to be at the same time too judgmental, but also at the same time knowing that drinking doesn't do good things for this person. I know. Yeah. And uh, it's also the case that much of this ill is brought about by people who do not have that empathy, who do not have that compassion. So these people sit on their billions and trillions knowing that the other 99.99% of us have that empathy, have that compassion, and will distribute the 5% of wealth that we've got ourselves where the other 0.001% take 95% of the wealth. And they're just saying, I don't give a shit. I'm sitting at the top of the you know, food chain because I'm the strongest, I'm the best, I'm the most, you know, I, I beat Darwin's game. There's something, Kayla was saying something about that as well, that it has to do with a, a kind of um, a sense of uh, almost a patho- pathological sense or almost a soci- sociopathological sense, right? As, as a socio- and then she put it into the collective saying there's maybe a sociopathological socio-patho- narcissism, collective. Among group, use those terms, words, yeah, right? right, yeah. Well, a little more. Well, among among people, there are certain. I don't know. If, there are individuals like that. I mean, you take the people who have the privilege and who don't have the empathy. This is what we're talking about, right? Those those might have those kind of characteristics, and then it can be at the group level. They can hide in the group. There's a herd mentality saying, "Well, others are doing this too, man. So why should I be the one singled out to have to give away my wealth?" You know, that, there's that. So sure, but. Um, I want to ask you, Sam, does Ahimsa, do you think, have bearing on the parenting issues that you brought up earlier? It just seems to me that it might provide a, a way of making it less sort of postmodern relativistic mm-hmm. in the sense of saying, okay, so, so one of my offspring says this, the other says quite the opposite, and so I just feel like, anyway. but if you say, look, I, I stayed with my code, and it was interpreted in different ways by others, but I was actually in some way doing the empathetic ahimsa for as a way of being and it was following the Tao. And so there isn't any, I don't have any qualms about that. They, they, they'll, they'll, it's still part of their learning path to, uh, to assimilate that. And then one day, hopefully they'll say, oh, the thanks, but maybe it's not now. Yeah, I like that perspective. And thanks for asking that question. The other story I might, 
Let me close the door. No worries. There's another story I want to tell you, which is about my son. And I think I've mentioned it a couple of times, but when he declared as an art major at UC Santa Cruz, I joked around with everybody that says, I've lost my Asian father cred, you know. No proper self-respecting Asian father would have let their son, their number one son, declare art as their major and pay those umpteen gazillion thousands of dollars to go to a university to get an art degree. Okay, that's the way Asians are supposed right? to. Right, okay, Asians would see it that way, right? Okay. So I said, fine, you know, go do art. Three years into it, all his friends, you know, his brothers and the frat and whatever, are getting business uh, uh, internships. They're getting uh, part-time jobs at software companies. They're doing this and that. So he calls me up and says, Dad, what am I going to do with an art degree? <laughs> and that was a moment did, that did, I was Did you have talks with him? Did you have talks with him prior to getting the art degree about, you know, his vocation and his calling and, and what he wants to do and shit like that? Subtly, very small. I said, do what you want. But then three years in, he actually took the initiative to contact me and said, what can I do with an art degree? So I had a conversation with him at that time that said, Nick, you've gotten good at art. You've got skills in you know, video production, graphic design, et cetera, et cetera. But I'll make you a deal. I will pay for one more year of college. And therefore, he would go five years if he actually agrees to get at least a minor in a STEM or a business degree. Now, you know, we can quibble about whether or not that was the right thing to do, but given that that was the situation, I said, if you want to do that, and at the time I could afford that, right? So I, I could do that for him. So he took the five years and he got a double major. He got a major in art and he got a major in computer science, not just a minor, he actually did complete a major in computer science. And now he's at Facebook as a software engineer making more than I'm making, okay? Like scant four or five years after all of that happened. <clears throat> so he's the one that came to me and said, I made things too easy for him when he was young. <laughs> On the other hand, you know, that was something I did for him because I could, and now it's seems to have set him up so at least financially he's in better situation than he otherwise could have been. So that is a case where I knew that letting him go and find his own exploration might lead him back uh, if I didn't just clamp down on him right away. If I clamped down on him right away, I might have just cost him the rest of our lives and not had that intimacy with him, right? No, I there mean, still the other issue there, but sorry. No, but I mean, so much, so much of this, Sam, in terms of parenting. I mean, I yeah, again, I, I, I really, I, I, I don't follow the Dalai Lama and everything, but you know, in in the case of parenting, it really kindness is my religion, and I just, it really is. And it's not. I try to be that way with everyone, but there are there are some brutalists where, hey, you know what? I'm not going to draw the line here, and don't step across that. Seriously, don't. <laughs> but. Um, but, but there, without it, I mean, there's a difference between being permissive and being, you know, o opening the door in such a way that even if they don't open the door for you ever, they'll remember you opening the door. There was amazing, what the heck was the name of this film? It was a beautiful film. It was all in Chinese. So I, it's, you know, subtitles uh, for me. And it was tell you what it was about it was about this you start i believe you start in hong kong and the the mother i i think she was just going through a divorce there's a kid who is six to eight yep anyway not more than nine um and he he had privilege in, in Hong Kong. They had their, 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 their nice apartment, not, not super ultra. They have a nice apartment. They have television. He has his, he has his device. Okay. And um, 
you know, and they have chicken McNuggets and, and stuff like that. Okay, great. The mother, ca the mother can't handle the kid and the need for having her own job, et cetera. So she has to get her, herself back on her feet. So she takes her son to the countryside and she leaves her son with her mother. So the son's grandmother. And this is way out in the country. I mean, it is. They're living in a little village and the, the houses are made out of uh, wood um, and, and, and stick. I mean, you know, not, not necessarily even carpentered wood. Okay. But there's, there, I mean, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. Something, yeah. So, the, but they're living there and McDonald's, <laughs> Wi-Fi, television, and not, nothing at all like that. So the kid, the first, the first time he's there, you know, he's like, his battery dies eventually. He's like, where do I plug this in? He says, well, you don't. And the grandmother hardly speaks. She hardly speaks. She's not that she is, at first I thought maybe she's mute, but she hardly speaks. And she is all the time, what can I do for you? I know this is very hard. And, and, and you're without your mother, I mean, that's like, she really understands the kids without his mother as well. So he's, you know, he's culture shock and he's abandoned by his mother, not, not literally, but because, so she tries to do, and he says, and she says, what can I make you for eating? She says, I want chicken. He was thinking of chicken McNuggets, no, chicken nuggets. So she makes boiled chicken, <laughs> boiled, boiled chicken. And it's, it's, it's presentation is different. It's like this is boiled chicken in a soup kind of thing. And he knocks it over. And then he goes, he gets really rebellious. He, he, he hides her slippers, her shoes that she puts outside the, because they don't go into the house with them. So she, he hides hers. And he takes great pleasure in seeing her look, trying to find it and then having to walk across the, 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 the gravel areas and go and do her work. I, I think she, I don't know what she does. She washes or she does things of that sort. Or maybe she's in the fields. She comes back. And uh, he is, and he's bored. And he, so he amuses himself by hiding things from her. And she just patiently either does without them, wraps her feet in a cloth, or, so he can't foil her. So he's trying to foil her. He, he, and she just goes ahead. And I remember that at one point in the movie, they, she wants to surprise him by taking him into town because he really misses this. And they go into town and the town is a medium-sized town. It's not just a little village. It's actually a, a medium-sized town. And um, they have to take a bus to go there. So they, they take the bus and it takes them hours to get to the town. And then there's a fair and then there's, and she takes him to all of the things and he wants more and he wants this and he wants that. She gets all that and she gets him the things that he wants to go home, get very material, very material oriented to the kid. So then they go back and she doesn't have the money for the bus because she spent it on him. So she gives, but she has enough money for him. So she puts him on the bus, puts him on the bus, tells the bus driver, make sure he gets off here. And they live, I mean, it's not too far for them to walk from that road to the little village where they are. And he knows, he knows that way. So he goes back and he just takes one of the toys with him. She has all the bags and she walks all the way back that it took hours for the bus to go. So it was like seven or eight hours later that he's waiting there and he sees her walk back and he, she, he's, she's carrying all of the stuff that she had bought for him. And then she comes and she arranges it for him and she's happy with him and excited about that. Anyway, all of this goes on. And toward the end of the film, the mother comes back to take her son home. And he's so excited about that. And he just wants to go. And then in the end, he, he, he comes back before, before he leaves. And there's a whole emotional scene of him connecting with his grandmother, but he is not connected with her throughout. She was just a pain in the friggin' neck. 
and she, she's like couldn't understand anything and she's ignorant and she doesn't understand what how civilized people are supposed to live etc cetera, etc cetera. all that but in the end he it's clear how much she taught him about life and how much he loves her and that was nice to put that at the very end of the film um but um that whole path the way she was i had difficulty watching the film without thinking that kid he doesn't get any food tonight he goes to his room i mean that <laughs> i'm gonna be a little bit too much for me <laughs> but she was not doing that yep. and it was beautiful so it was a good lesson for me too I wish I could remember the name of the film. It was very nice. I will think more about Ahimsa. By the way, are you crowd bowling? Today, I can't. No. can't. I have a uh, 11 o'clock that I postponed because my session with my ex-wife to deal with uh, the 15, now 27 things we have to do to get the divorce done. Didn't happen yesterday, so I've got to do it today. And then at 12 o'clock, I'm actually uh, recording my mom on video because uh, she recently wrote an autobiography. It's about 18, 20 pages or so. And I found out things that I had never known before oh. about her. So I nice. said, hey, why don't you, uh, Sit with me. I'm going to interview you. I'm going to ask you about these things I didn't understand. Let's record it for you know the kids and their kids and future generations. Dude. So nice. She, so I have you today. another two or three uh, Zoom sessions coming up today. So. All right. Yeah, I'm going to do. Uh, now, but I would. I would just. I, mean, I can't. I can't. All I can do is invite you and hope to attract you. I'm not. Can't. I can't. There's no, no, I can't incentivize no you in any other way, but I just, I really think this would be good for you and for, I mean, now I'm trying to sell it to you, uh, but I really think there's a home there in Crowdpole that, um, that would flourish with you and could also be meaningfully, a meaningful engagement, a non-waste of time for you. If, if No, I like the times that I've actually participated. I just feel bad that I haven't actually gotten onto the platform yet and actually engaged there. Yeah, 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 you should do that. Man. About, you know, what was being discussed during the week. Because there's stuff going on. Conversations are amazing. It's this kind of conversations, but about creating an interoperable platform that would allow, you know, the altruistic wallet to flourish, et cetera, et cetera. No, I like it. I like the people I've met okay. there. So thank you for yeah, yeah. inviting me and I will avail myself of it next weekend. Uh, I hope you do. And in between, if you can get onto the Crowdball platform yes. and just, you know, you know, there's really not, I don't spend a lot of time, but I'm subscribed such a way that when somebody sends something to one of the message boards, right it comes to my email. I mean, I, I, I tend to have too much email anyway, but it, it doesn't come that often. They don't have, it's not a huge community doing a lot of stuff. So at least I see, you know, some updates and occasionally I respond and that's it. By the way, part of the reason, and this is actually a piece of good news, so I might want to share it with you. And I don't know it's being recorded, so I'm not going to put in too many specifics, but I've been like a week and a half late putting together a paper for uh, my CEO. And uh, so he's uh, pretty excited about this thing that he asked me to do. So he checks up on me a, bit, a couple times a week if so I give him a work in progress. So anyway, on Friday night, Saturday morning at 3.30 in the morning, I finally package it up together. Not polished, but at least it's a complete draft that I could send him and it's about 12 pages of you know text and diagrams. And it's for this new way of potentially creating a new ecosystem around our products so that we can actually get the other people to play along, alongside and on top of our platform. So he sent me about eight o'clock in the morning on Saturday, something like that, a little two line uh, response to my paper saying, good write up, I like this, I wanna to talk to you on Monday. Nice. And so I said, great, you know, let's do it. So last night, which was not Monday, last night at six o'clock, he calls me up on the phone. We talked for half an hour and he likes what's uh, been written up. And it was a result of a discussion he and I had had about a week and a half ago. And so 
he wants me to basically make it possible. He wants me to lead the charge to create this new offering uh, that we're going to build and then uh, market. So I, I like what's going on there. And that's part of the guilt I feel during the week, which is I know I'm late on this already. In fact, it turned out to be a week and a half late on that paper. And uh, <laughs> so I finally get that done. And now there's the next thing. And he wants to launch this, you know, in some small yeah. number of months. So okay. I'm parallel processing with you in, in the stuff that was due like tomorrow. Yeah. And I'm going to be at least a week late. But and, and I still have a bunch of work to do today. So, I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I hear you. But that's really cool. I'm really good. By the way, you've seen I, I feel privileged to have that problem, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Not exactly. having that problem. <laughs> My goodness. That's. But yeah, the thing is to keep that. <laughs> they don't keep that privilege. You see, it's like, it's, well, how are you going to keep that? So that's what I say. You know, not all privilege is bad. Just I try not to abuse it. You know. But that doesn't mean that other people have to. That you know, your privilege is on the backs of others. You know, that's that's the point. You know why? That's not needed. Um, the. Oh yeah, if you're doing ecosystem stuff, the, the, uh, there's this great thing about learning ecosystems for societal evolution that has to do with, it's a book, Peter Senge has a foreword. I don't know if you know of that, but it it's, could be useful if you want it. Oh, it's a free download. Okay. I'll, I'll put it into our, I'll put it into our uh, okay. social media feed. I mean, what do you call that? Facebook Messenger. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it, it leads to the webpage, which gives a nice summary on the webpage itself, but then it's a free download. Like I said, Peter Senge has a summary and it has it's, it's largely about learning ecosystems, but that you could put that in corporate settings. You put that all yeah. over the place. How do you create? Peter it's was a nick of nicks. But learning in front of almost any word and have a new book. It makes a book. Uh, it, but it's a really the nick of nicks. It's really what the ecosystem is a community of communities. It's that. Uh, and it's about this for, you know, evolution of society. So it has that bigger mm -hmm. thing. But let me share that with you. Just want to say, and then we're probably going to, should go soon, because mm -hmm. I'm going to have like just over 10 minutes before I'm, Going to crop point, I should probably put something in my mouth before that. Yep. In my tummy better. Um, my father's autobiography. Hopefully, this is not. <sighs> we tried. Uh, my brother and I tried to talk him out of this title. Uh, anyway, here is our biography, and it's called "Simply Genius." Self. Well, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Simply Genius. That's his autobiography, and it's like. Okay, well, <laughs> doesn't have any, you know, self-esteem issues. No, it's quite the opposite. So anyway, there we go. But yeah, maybe there's with your mom. There's different things. You, you know, just uh, curiously, I actually did have some notes that I took from last week that are brought here, just in case we needed something to talk about. <laughs> yeah. We can do this next week again. But I, I really like the things that we covered today. It, it went yeah. some areas that were unexpected, but uh, I think insightful and timely and appropriate so next week we're going to be in a different world at least at least oh, yeah. in the u.s and i think it's going to be a different it's again it's not going to be consummated he's going to win i am not sure that he's going to win you know oh, i see you're not sure that he's going to win right I, no, I, I'm, I'm not, not either not. i'm not either you know especially because my friends are talking about how they're they're mail-in the, the expats from around the world are talking about how their mail-in ballots are not going to get voted they're going to get lost you know yeah shit like that you're going to pre-declare a winner he's going to invalidate the process he's going to pull all kinds of shenanigans all kind of shit and then even if he does i mean there's going to, there's there's going to be chaos afterwards no matter what if he wins there's i think uh, uh the 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 descent into chaos is longer term and more problematic and more if he wins and more severe if he wins but the, if he doesn't win the the chaos is going to be more acute and more intense in the short term and, and and I'm not sure where that leads. So it, no matter what, there's I, I can't imagine this being a calm November. Uh, and no, between yeah. November and January it was January 18th when this actually the swearing in. Something like it's that. it's something like that. It's uh, there's a whole there's a whole period of time that it's going to be rife with with chaos. Remember the uh, first scene in Doom, the book or the trilogy, or the okay. series? Yeah. They land on Arrakis, right? Uh -huh. What's the first thing that House Atreides needs to do? It was, it was, it was something hegemonic. I don't remember what. What did they have to do? They have to sweep the entire mansion, the house. 
right to the know, dust, right on the same or you know possible devices, you know bombs, oh, that spy. But equipment. also, they, also to keep it, also to keep it, right. I mean, they, they, they it, it would, it had to be like their hometown, like their home planet more, right. Well, the but, point was that the they point had was of all the shit that House Harkonnen might have left, right. You know, to right. sort of spy and create hate, chaos, you know, for House Atreides, who was moving in, right. Got it. So that's this shifting of the houses idea. Who knows what they, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. what kind of shit they're leaving in the White House and in that's various true, other too. places, the Pentagon. You have serious disinfection. Jeez, I would not want to move in there after that. It's like God. time to rebuild. Yeah. After that. And, and, and indeed, as we've, as many have said, right? You know, we just don't want Trump to win. But I don't know. We don't have an enlightened leadership necessarily going forward with Biden. It's not. It's not that. Neither are good choices. No. All one can say is, both but again, one is less evil. Indeed, and I think that the conversation we had today was one that was, even though we didn't go to the list that you had prepared for conversation topics and so on, it seems to me that both the the Halloween or the All Saints or the the Samhain, Samhain, what can you do that? What do you do it? Something. It's something, 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 something thing uh, was uh, appropriate time for that conversation and for because of the nature of privilege and the upcoming moment in history. So that I think the conversation was quite uh, appropriate. The right one to be you had a list of three that you uh, had to come up with. Let me at least part with a list of three, which I always Good. go back to because it's the three tenets of nice. uh, Taoism. It's simplicity, compassion, and patience. Those are the three for Taoism. And, and, and then at the risk of, I don't want to open up another Pandora's thing here, but I, I have my issues with compassion versus empathy. Uh, because compassion to me is only one aspect of empathy that relates to those who are suffering. Whereas empathy can relate to those who are suffering as well as those who are celebrating or who are, I mean, empathy is connecting to the other state of being. Compassion is holding space and, and, and uh, well, it's empathetic engagement with the suffering of the other. So that's worth exploring because I kind of saw it in, uh, in a different relationship as well. So, okay. but let's not do it now. Let's we can hold that and hold that for another time. Yeah, All it's right. good to leave. It's like parking your bicycle on the downhill. So when you get back on it, you can just get going. It's not right. There we go. Okay. Enjoy. All right then. Yep. Thank you, you Alexander. Too. Okay. Thanks for this. Cheers. Bye for now.